this lesson we're learning about evolution and mass extinction and this is our starting point for topic two in unit four which is about the continuation of life on earth so let's put some context and history behind evolution to start with so to transport yourself back to the 1600s and most of western civilization believed in natural theology and that argues for the existence of god based on natural phenomena so essentially the wonders of nature are due to the creations of god and at the time, the idea was that every unique organism has unique and unchanging characteristics. But over time, scientists started to actually observe a greater range of species and see that there was huge numbers of similarity between species and also within species. So they began to wonder how this was all linked. More and more fossils began to be discovered, and these contained animals and plants that were so different to modern species, while others from similar regions and time periods were surprisingly similar to modern species. And it started to become a little bit cotton eye joe here. Where did all these species actually come from and where did they go? Now, at the time, there were many scientists actually having a crack at deciding what was going on, but we'll only mention a few in here. Now, Jean-Baptiste Lamar comes along and while he himself was quite religious, as was pretty standard at the time, he studies a lot of natural history and he comes up with his own theories on what we now know as evolution. Now, he postulates that the environment has an effect on the characteristic of an organism, okay, and that these traits could uh, be passed along to an organism in their offspring, okay, makes sense. But keep in mind that Mendel's work on inheritance happens in the mid 1800s, so Lamarck's about 50 years earlier, so this is all still brand new territory. What Lamarck actually also says is that an organism's traits are due to the efforts they put in during their lifetime. So this is our classic, you know, giraffe picture that's associated with Lamarck saying, Oh, well, if the, you know, the giraffe is not tall enough to reach the tree during its lifetime, it will just grow a longer neck and it'll be fine. Now, despite some of Lamarck's ideas being discredited, he laid out a really solid foundation for our current understanding of evolution and for upcoming scientists. So in the 1850s, along come two more scientists, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, both of whom study and collect natural samples from all around the world. So this is the um, trek around the world of Charles Darwin in his uh, ship, the Beagle. So they're both sort of doing similar field work at a similar time. They're traveling around the world and both come to really similar conclusions about how organisms actually evolved. And the story goes that Wallace had a bit of a brainwave. He wrote a paper, he sent it to Darwin, sort of as a mentor to check it over. Darwin had already come to similar conclusions a few years before, so it kind of kicked him into gear to act and publish his own research. And they published a joint scientific paper in 1858 arguing for evolution by natural selection. And these were pretty controversial ideas at the time. And then a year later, Darwin decided to publish his own long-awaited work on the origin of species, from which the main observations were that populations vary in their traits and that species provide more offspring than the environment can support, so most will fail to survive or at least reproduce. Now, from these observations came his inferences, and these inferences were that individuals that had traits that were advantageous to their specific environment were able to survive and reproduce more easily than others, right? And this unequal ability to reproduce in a population means that these favorable traits will accumulate in a population over many generations. And these are the ideas that underpin natural selection, where environmental pressures select for advantageous traits to enhance survivability. Now, Darwin and Wallace, you know, and a few others mixed in there as well, they argue that evolution occurred through this natural selection. Now, Darwinian evolution is the basis from which our current understanding of evolution arose, although there's been some tweaks and refinements, you know, particularly in our understanding um, of genomes and all those kinds of things have become more refined. But evolution is the change in the genetic composition of a population during successive generations, which may result in the development of a new species. And evolution is a bit of a broad umbrella term, and under it sits microevolution and macroevolution. Now, microevolution is the small scale variation of allele frequencies within a species or a population in which the descendant is of the same taxonomic grouping as the ancestor. So essentially, this is just evolution on a really small scale. It's an outcome of natural selection where the types of alleles that exist in a gene pool of a species change, but not so much that they become a new, a new species. So, for example, if we talk about antibacterial um, resistant bacteria, uh, it's the same species. They've just picked up a new trait that is advantageous to them surviving in their environment. So if enough of these traits start to accrue or accumulate, it can lead to evolution to become a new species. And that's where macroevolution comes in handy. 
So macroevolution is the variation of allele frequency over time at the level of a species over geological time, but it results in a divergence of taxonomic groups in which the descendant is a different taxonomic group to the ancestor. So it might be that a new species is created. So essentially so much of that change has accrued over such a large time scale, be it in genotype or phenotype, you know, they're similar, right? That a new species or genus can arise. And this is known as divergence. So when so many of those small variations accumulate, that speciation occurs, a new species is created, you know, they have to accrue over many generations. It's not happening over their lifetime. It's a very long-term change. And macroevolution and microevolution are fundamentally the same process, but just on very different timescales.